Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, all. I'm, I'm real pleased to make it today. Last time I was scheduled to speak, I never made it. First time I never, never fronted, and um, Andrew had to take my message, the message for me. We had COVID in the house, and we, uh, we had to go into isolation, and I missed out coming out of isolation by one day. So I've got a spare message in my back pocket. It'll keep. It's a bit disappointing, eh, when you get a message ready and you can't do it. But anyway, it'll keep, I hope. And um, this morning we're going to talk about change. Who likes change? Oh, some people like change. Other people don't like change. You know, when I was at, um, used to go to work, which is a while ago now, um, don't be too envious, you people who still got to go to work, um, we came to realise that change is normal. Expect, just go to work every day expecting that something could well change. That's, that's the world we live in. Change is normal. And often I just felt, oh, we just got something sorted out and sussed and it's really going real good and hello, we're changing it again. So I used to get a bit uptight about that, but I came to realise that change is normal. That's how we live our lives today. Change is normal. Well, we're going to talk today about a man who God changed his life. And I tell you what, when you hear who his name is, Jacob... He was a rat bag, and, but you know what? He, he ended up okay, but it was because he allowed God to work in his life. I'll just put these books down. I just, he allowed God to work in his life. So we're going to talk today about how God can change people's lives. But just as a, something a bit lighter, up on the board, we've got some things that are on the gym that I attend. I go to a gym. And there's these sayings that were on the, on the notice board, and I thought they were quite cool. It or they're about people that they're a bit about change, sh- sayings about change. And the first one is, you don't have to see the whole staircase; just take the first step. Right? So we're thinking to change something. You don't have to actually get the the whole story; just take the first step. Martin Luther King said that. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. That's what Winston Churchill said. Next one, you can never cross the ocean until you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. There's another saying about change, facing change. And this is, I like this one, continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. And I've, I've noticed that um, as I've gone through life is that a lot of people say, oh, I'll do that when I'm really, really good at it, but that's not often how it works out in life. You've actually got to get started. You've actually got to get started on, on doing things, and you will probably will end up good at it, but it's a work in progress. For my Father's Day, Father's Day came up. It was a few weeks ago now. On Father's Day, I was given a book, and it's called When Jews and Palestinian, Palestinians Meet Jesus. It was given to me for Father's Day. It's written by a lady called Julia Fisher. I'm halfway through the book and really enjoying it. Now, where am I up to here? I'm, I'm, oh, look, I'm just past halfway. And it's really good, and it's about people in Israel, Egypt and Palestine, who have become believers in Jesus. And the change Jesus has made to their lives and the amazing things they are doing now in reaching out to their own people. It's an incredible, it's amazing. And these are just um, uh, people that have taken the courage. It's, you've got to be brave to believe in Jesus in those countries, but they are brave people with God's help. And they have not, are not only are their lives totally changed and blessed by God, but they are now in turn um, communicating the, the word of the, the good news about Jesus Christ to other people. And their li- other people's lives are being changed. So it's a good read. So we're not finished it. Um, give me a few more weeks. No. Oh, look, I'm, it's all another two weeks reading there. And um, I'm very happy to lend it to you. Um, so that'll be It's a good book. It's a good book. And um, so it's about change. Today we're going to see how God intervened in, Jake, intervened in Jacob's life and what a huge change it made in, in his life for the good. He needed to change. He was a rat bag. And the reason we're talking about Jacob today is because you're saying, well, I thought we were in the book of Hebrews. Well, we are studying through the book of Hebrews, but part of what we're doing is in Hebrews chapter 11, there's the hall of fame of all the great men of faith in the Old Testament. And guess whose name is in there? It's this rat bad guy called Jacob. He was a shocker. We're going to talk, think about some of the things that he did. But you know what? He made it to the Hall of Fame. 
And he made it to the Hall of Fame because he allowed God to intervene and change his life. And you know what? We can make it to the Hall of Fame in God's sight if we allowed God to come in and intervene and change our lives. Now, I don't think any of us will be sitting here today and saying, well, I'm all good, man. I don't need any changes. There's always something you can do to make things a little bit better. And um, God intervened in in, um, Jacob's life, and his life was very different. So he's in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. This is our reference to Hebrews today. It says, by faith... Jacob became a great man of faith when he was dying, just before he died. He blessed each of Joseph's sons and he worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. He was an old, old man. He was just close to his his death and he was blessing Joseph's sons. But it says the great thing there about it is it says by faith, Jacob. He became a man of God. He became a man of faith. And that is why we're talking about him today. But when we think about the things that he used to do, you say, well, how on earth did that guy make it? Well, you know, a lot of us will probably say, how because of our past, we say, well, how did I make it to where I got to? But God is in the business of changing people's lives. The story of Jacob is recorded in Genesis chapter 25 to 49. He takes up quite a few pages in the Bible. What a journey Jacob had been on to finally have his name in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Fame. Jacob's life had been changed radically and it needed to be. His name actually means this and his name interpreted means cheater, schemer and deceiver. How would you like that? He was a cheater, he was a deceiver and he was a a schemer. And that was what he was all about as a younger man in the first part of his life. Jacob had deceived his brother Esau. He had deceived his father Isaac. Jacob had deceived his father-in-law Laban. Although Jacob became a changed man, he still had to live with the consequences of his early life. And you know what? That still stands today. We still have to live, although God forgives us for the things we do wrong, we often still have to live with the consequences of the things that we've done wrong. And Jacob had to live with the consequences of the things he'd done wrong, even though he had had God's forgiveness. Jacob was in turn deceived. You heard the old saying, what goes round comes round. Jacob was in turn deceived by his father-in-law Laban, and that's a story. He woke up in, in the fast after his wedding with the wrong lady in the bed. I don't, I've never worked that one out, but um, I don't think about it too much. But Jacob, was, he was deceived by his father-in-law. The custom was, was that the, um, there was a, an order in which way the, the, the daughters got married. And old um, Jacob had his, his uh, heart set on, on someone else. But the father-in-law thought, well, I'm going to marry this daughter off first anyway. So he, deceived, he was deceived by his father-in-law Laban. He was deceived by his first wife Leah. That's the one. And he was also deceived dreadfully by his own children. So he lived with those consequences. So the question is today, on a more positive note, is how did God change Jacob's life? What did God do? And this morning we're going to look at the story of Jacob when his life was changed at a place called Penel. We could summarize the story and say that Jacob had a wrestling match with God, but we need more than that to understand what happened. This wrestling match has aspects in it that applies to our lives. If we're wanting to be changed for better, I'm sure all of us would like to think that we could make some changes in our lives to make ourselves improve ourselves. This wrestling match was a turning point in Jacob's life. He was never the same again. From the account of his wrestling match Jacob had with God, we can draw four principles on the four phases God used to change Jacob's life from being a cheater to a great man of God who got his name in the Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11. So let's look at those four principles. Before we just do that, just remind ourselves of what we're dealing with here and what Jacob actually did. He stole Esau's birthright. That's his brother's birthright. He stole the blessing from his father. He deceived his father Isaac and he stole the blessing. And in the olden days, the blessing was really mattered. You know, it's the, the blessing from the father was a big deal. Um, he also tricked and deceived his father-in-law Laban. Okay, so Laban deceived him, but he also deceived Laban. He deceived Laban by getting the ended up when he left. He took all the best um, stock on the farm and he tricked his father-in-law and, and he ended up in Laban. 
ended up with the inferior animals on the farm. And, and Jacob, when he took off, he took all the good stuff. So he deceived his father-in-law. So, you know, that's just a bit more information on what he got up to. He was always using people and always getting into trouble because he used people. This, um, ex he, this experience transformed his life, this meeting with God, when he had this wrestling match. From, and from this occasion, he was never the same again. And just uh, when we meet Jesus and allow Jesus Christ to come into our lives, we'll never be the same again. Our lives will be changed forever. So let's look at these four things that God did or God used to change Jacob's life. Now, some of these things might apply to us and some might not. Well, we're going to go through these four things. The first one is, is that it starts, he started with a crisis. Let's read the verses. Here we go. Verse 22, that night, it's up on the, on the data. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. What, what's happening here is background is after Jacob had spent 20 years, he had to take off because he was fearing for his life from Esau. So he took off and he, um, he was returning back home. God had promised him that he was, he was going to return home. So he was returning home after being away for 20 years. And he was on his way home, and Esau was coming to meet him, meet him, and Jacob was fear shaking in his boots because Esau had 400 men with him, okay? And he didn't know whether Esau was coming as a, in friendship or he was coming to get him. He didn't know. So here we go. That night Jacob took, he was close to meeting up with Esau. Esau was coming one way with his people and Jacob was coming his, this way with his family and all his, Jacob by now was a very, very wealthy man. He had thousands of cattle and sheep and all, whatever they had. He was a wealthy man by now. It was a promise God had given him. So anyway, here's the verses. That night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two female servants his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent, and he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched and he was, as he wrestled with the men. Now you might think, well, that's a strange lot of verses there. Jacob and his family were about to meet his brother Esau, who Jacob had cheated and deceived, and he was coming to meet him. Jacob and his brother Esau had not seen each other for 20 years. Jacob was terrified, expecting his brother was going to take revenge for the way Jacob had deceived him. As I said, Esau had 400 men with him. So Jacob sent his family ahead to a place of safety. That night became the turning point in Jacob's life as he met God, and God changed him for good. God wanted to get Jacob's attention, and though it may seem strange to us the way God got Jacob's attention, and that is to engage in a wrestling match with Jacob, um, it, it, it does seem a strange story, but that's what God did. But let me explain a bit. We all know that the way to win a wrestling match is you've got to pin your opponent down until he gives up. You know what? The wrestling match was a long one. It lasted all night. Jacob had a crisis in his life, and as a result of that crisis... God got his attention, and that's how God got his attention. God uses different ways to get people's attention. He meets us at whatever level he finds us in order to lift us to where he wants to be. And it's amazing when you listen to different people about how they became believers, and here they tell you their story, and often it's a, a surrounding a crisis in their life, and often it's a, a, a God has approached them in a way that's actually really, really relevant to those people. Just for instance, in the Bible, there's some good examples of that. Abraham the pilgrim, God came to him as a traveller, Genesis 18. Moses, who was a shepherd, God came to him in a burning bush. Joshua the general, God came to him as a soldier, Joshua chapter 5. Jacob had spent most of his adult life wrestling with people, Esau, Isaac and Laban, and even his wives, and God came to him in a wrestling match. If Bethel, God had promised to bless Jacob from, um, and from a material point of view, the promise had been fulfilled for Jacob, who was now a very wealthy man. But there was much more to a blessing than flocks, herds and money and servants. There's also the matter of a godly character, and that's what Jacob um, didn't have at that stage. 
So my question to all of us today is, is have any of us in a wrestling match this week? Have we, any of us got crises in our lives? And we're going to see how God dealt with um, the crises in Jacob's life today. Have you ever considered when you, if you do have a crisis or you've been through a crisis in your life that it may be that God might well be behind those circumstances? I know in my life when God's really needed to get a message through to me, there's often been a crisis in my life and often it's been uh, centred around health issues and um, when God's needed to deal with me. At this point, um, and so we see that God often does use a crisis to get our attention. Um, when I used to, I always talk about when I used to go to the prison, I'm going to do it again because it's a good illustration, but the, the guys down at the prison say coming to prison was the best thing that could happen to me because God got my attention. And I heard that just about in every course we went to. The guys would say, come into prison. And they were then had, most of them were actually believers who had actually gone off the rails. But most of them would say, I ended up in prison and God got my attention. So it was a crisis. And that's exactly what happened with Jacob. You know, it's a bit like the mother eagle. I didn't know about this, but the mother eagle, the, the baby eagles are just so happy sitting in the nest. Did you know that? They just love it. They just love it. But Mother Eagle knows better. She knows they can't spend the rest of their life sitting in the nest. So you know what she does? She didn't just doesn't boot them out. She actually makes the nest so uncomfortable. She roughs it up. She makes the nest so uncomfortable that the baby eagle says, oh, I'm out of here. So it jumps out and has to learn to fly. And a bit, it's a bit like that with God, that, that God makes things a little bit uncomfortable for us and it turns out for our good. We get better. We, get, we improve. So the mother creates a crisis in the little eagle's life. And today we can ask ourselves, how's your nest? Has it been disturbed? <laughs> right. So we first of all see with Jacob's change in his life, it came about because of a crisis in his life. He had this wrestling match. He also had a double crisis, didn't he? Because he was actually meeting Esau and he feared. He, he was scared stuff. He was really scared. The next thing is our verses, we, the next phase of Jacob's um, change in his life came with commitment. Commitment. And it says in verse 26 of our verses, it says, Then the man said, it was actually God, Then the man said, Let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob said that. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob's attitude is persistence. He's determined he's going to stick with it, fight it out. He will not quit. Jacob wasn't a quitter. He's basically saying to God, I'm sticking with this struggle until I benefit from it. He wasn't going to wrestle all night for no, nothing, no reward. That's what he's saying. Oh, and he says, I want something good out of all this. I've made an effort. I've put a lot of energy into this. I've made an investment of time and energy in the struggle, and I'm not going to give up. Jacob wasn't a quitter. You know, God does use a crisis to get our attention, but even after he's gotten our attention, he does, often doesn't solve our problems immediately. He waits for a while. Why God often waits to resolve a problem in our lives? Because he wants to see if we really mean business. Am I really serious about change or is this jump passing whim? So because of Jacob's attitude, God could see that Jacob really, really did want to be blessed by God. The normal reaction to our weakness and problems is to run from them. That's what Jacob had done. That's, that's Jacob has spent his life running from problems. Many people miss God's best because they give up too soon. We are great starters, but we don't finish. How many of us in the last 12 months have started a physical fitness program? How many of us are still on it? We're great starters, but we don't continue it. They reckon that of gym memberships, probably a huge percentage of them, the people go for a couple of weeks and then they pay for the year and they never turn up again. It's, it's right, isn't it? A lot of marriages fail when problem, the problems could be resolved with some further commitment, resolve, communication and effort. And um, when you, I've talked to people whose marriages have failed and say, well, you know, what happened? What went wrong? And I'm not being nosy about them, but I'm just talking to them. About it. They're talking to me about it. And I say, what went wrong? And they tell you the problems they had. And I'm thinking, yeah, oh, gosh, that's not a big deal. Let's, why don't you sit down and talk about it, try and change it? But people just tend to walk, or get up and walk away. And um, probably most of us have had some of those problems in our own marriages and we're still together because we're committed, because we communicate, because we, um, we're, we're open to improvement and changing. 
So Jacob said, I'm committed to this struggle and I'm not giving up until God blesses me. Galatians 6 and 9 says, Let us not become weary of doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Paul is saying, hang in there, be committed to getting God's best. Jacob was, he hung in there in that wrestling match. There is hope you will be able to change, but don't give up. This is an encouraging message. If God can change Jacob, he can change us as well. Phase three, confession. The man asked him, remember the man's God actually, Jacob tells us that. The man asked him, what is your name? Now, now God knew Jacob's name, but you know, so what's behind? Why did God ask him the name? And Jacob had to say, and what is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob, he answered. Why did God ask his name? Because God wanted him to admit who he was. You know what? In Bible times, your name you were given was a description of your character. It was a label. And when Jacob said, I'm a cheater, it was an act of self-revelation, an act of confession. When Jacob said, my name is Jacob, it was a reminder of all the people he'd hurt, all the heartbreak he'd caused, all the problems he'd been, had been the result of his hang-ups and personality. He was, he was admitting to it. And if we want God's blessing and want God to come in and change our lives, we've got to admit the problems that we have. We've got to, you've got to admit it. And um, I, I don't, I think if you go to um, Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the first things that they want you to do is to admit that you have a problem with drinking. And I know if you're um, in, the, in the prison, before you are privileged to go to all the um, programs they have for help you become a better person, improvement, you've actually got to admit that you have actually um, done what you, you're in there for. And um, of all the times I went to the prison and over many, many years, there was only about two guys who said I shouldn't be here. And the rest of them actually had admitted they're where they're, they're there because they need, they, they, that's, that's, they, did, they did the crime. They did the crime and they were getting the privileges of, of the programs that were put on to help them improve. But um, there's only about two guys um, who, who I actually can, came across who said, no, I shouldn't be here. Perhaps they shouldn't have been, I don't know. The stuff happens. Okay, first to you, we've got to win. The lesson that we want to do here is that you'll never be able to change until you admit the problems you have. First to yourself, then to God, and maybe then to some close friend. Remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It takes courage and humility to admit our faults. Believe me, I know. Oh, man, I'm always admitting my faults to someone. <laughs> Saying sorry to someone. Oh, it's not easy, is it? Doesn't go. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> phase four, cooperation. This is the last phase that God used with Jacob. Cooperation. We've got to cooperate with God, with what God wants to do in our lives. Verse 28 says, Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. God renamed him. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Jacob called the place penal, saying, it's because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. By the way, Jacob's new name Israel can be interpreted in a number of ways. Often I look up my um, commentaries on the Bible to get clarification. All I got in, in my time was confusion. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, these are all the different interpretations of the, the name Israel that came up. The first one, and, and these are all the commentaries we, I normally use, is the one where the interpretation was that the name Israel means God fights or, str or to struggle. Another one that means a God-mastered man. Another one is he who struggled with God. Then the last one is Prince of God. So um, the moment Jacob admitted what he, was, um, what he was and began to cooperate with God, he began to change for the better. We see in verse 29 that God blessed Jacob. God wants to bless you too today. If he, God wants to bless every one of us here today. He's just like an earthly father. God, our earthly father wants the very, very, very best for their children, don't they, and a mother. We do. We want the very, very best for them. You know, our heavenly father is exactly the same for us. He wants the very, very best for them. God wanted the best for Jacob as well. The entire nation of Israel was named after this man. What a privilege. 
Jacob came face to face with God, and, that, and he survived. That's a wonderful illustration, a wonderful thing that happened to Jacob. You know, Jacob was God's man, and God had his sights on him. And you know what? God's got his sights on everyone in this room today as well. He wants the best for us. Notice in verse 31, it says that Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life, and it was to be a constant reminder of two truths. One, we must depend on God and not our own strength. And secondly, we never solve problems by running away from them. And um, we don't have to stay the same. And Jacob, there's no more references, as far as I know, in Jacob's life of his old character trait faults. He went on, and as I say, he ends up in the Hall of Fame. Ephesians 3, uh, 4, 22 and 23 says, So get rid of your old self which made you live as you used to and put on the new self which is created in God's likeness. Jesus said you must be born again. Now here's our learning points. <sighs> Got to get through those. How does God speak to us today? He's probably not going to have a wrestling match with you. Probably not. I'll tell you three ways that God speaks to us today. First of all, through his word, the Bible. That is the most common way. You just, I, I never cease to be amazed when I have a, a something in my life that's going on, how my daily readings actually addresses that very problem. It's incredible. Try it. God speaks to us today mainly through his Bible. The word for today, 23rd of September, the other day says, one of the greatest gifts God has given us is scripture, but we frequently turn it into a burden. Do I have to read the Bible every day? <clears throat> That's the wrong question. You need to ask, what can I feed my mind on today so that I will flourish? The psalmist said that when you delight in God's word, you will prosper in whatever you do. It may not be to do with money. It may be to do with other things. There are many Bible reading aids. Now, we have a... Oh, I bought a couple here. Um, this is a good book. This is written by Harvey. Harvey, is Harvey's not here today. This is Harvey's book that he's written on the book of Hebrews. And if you would, it's got a daily readings in it, right? It's a, it's a reading for 365 readings in there. It is fantastic. And um, it's not heavy going. It's, it's great. And there's reading for each day. See Harvey, he'll arrange somehow to get you a coffee. Or copy. Um, I got given one because I'm a speaker. We, that's the perk. That's the perk of the job. You get given good. Get, you get given good books. <laughs> that's about yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the perk. <laughs> you get given books. <laughs> okay. Here's a, this is what I've done for a long time in my life. I use Scripture Union notes. I've used these for a long, long time now. They come in three different levels: kids or teenagers, um, um, uh, daily bread, and I use Encounter for God. It's a little bit different. Um, another great thing I recommend is, is get um, um, Word for Today on your app, on your phone. The app, take your five minutes to read it. Oh, good stuff in it. We're just, just, you know, you can have it on your app and just read it any time during the day. Daily reading on Word for Today on your app um, put out by Rima Media. That is really good. I would recommend that if you want God to speak to you, and by allowing God to speak to you, that will result in your life being changed. If you cooperate, um, the biggest way God speaks to us is through his word. The second way God speaks to us is just what Jacob did, a crisis, or our circumstances. Now, not our whole life is not a crisis. Hope it's not. <laughs> God uses circumstances, circumstances to speak to us. And um, as I mentioned earlier, God used to went round me up by normally with health issues right from when I was a young guy. And um, if I got crook, I'd say, gee, I need you, God. This is not good. <laughs> and we sort a few things out, and away we go again. Okay, the third way God speaks to us mainly today is through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I firmly believe we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit at conversion. Um, and we receive the Holy Spirit at conversion. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 to 29, it says, as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him. The Holy Spirit will give us peace if we're doing the right thing and we'll feel wrong if we're doing the wrong thing. That is the Holy Spirit working in us. In conclusion, God changed Jacob's life and he went on to become a great man of God. And God blessed him even more than he already had in the past. 
So my question to you today is, do you have a crisis in your life? Has been God been trying to get your attention? If you Have you looked behind the crisis to see if God wants to push you in a new direction or make a change in you? Secondly,